dealer. Then we can really buy. Dude, I'm confused. Dude, I'm completely confused. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Wait a minute. What kind of a movie is this? <laughs> There's something Damn, going on. Damn, Eric. Damn, I want to see the rest of the film. <laughs> well, ask what? your friend. Maybe he'll give you a yeah, copy. Yeah, Eric could get a copy of it. You know, I was watching it yesterday, and um, I'm still baffled. The, the Tippett thing has baffled me my entire life. I think everybody understands the uh, motorcade stuff, you know, in the school book depository, but nobody has ever resolved the Tippett affair. Yeah, well, you, you're the one who was telling me about it, and of course, that's why we're doing it. It is the untold story, or well, uh, not as often told, obviously. It was told in that that old movie, whatever that was. Whatever that was, that's the, that's the very end of the movie where Kevin Costner is doing the summation to the jury uh, in the Clay Shore trial in 1969. But th that's the only time you even see it is that reenactment with Gary Oldman in the entire movie. That's three hours into the film when you finally see that. And um, it's kind of shocking because that's the Warren Commission version of what happened, not what really happened. Um, when you see the other witnesses where he does the reenactment there with the heavy set guy, that's the key. That's the key. Oh, yeah, oh, for sure. And so let's go into it. Let's go into Tell it. Tell us the story. Okay, well, first of all, today's like Christmas for guys like me. This is November 22nd. This is, <laughs> this is our tinfoil hat conspiracy Christmas day where we bring out traditionally that we bring out the books and we call each other on the phone. I swear to God every year. And we start to reinvigorate the case, calling each other wherever we are in the world, people like-minded individuals who know enough about this case, uh, continue to revisit subtleties of the case. And, um, for the show, I started to reread some of the literature, you know, about a week ago to get uh, reacquainted with it. And man, is it a freaking mess. This Tippett case is a mess of a riddle wrapped in an enigma inside of a nutshell, Eric. The, um, the Tippett thing, I, I, I mean, I've heard so many different theories about Tippett that, um, you know, the more I dig down, the crazier it gets. You know, was he a bad cop? Did he know Ruby? Was he in the carousel club? Um, you know, you have a situation where all cars, just, just from a police angle, all cars were, were sent to the school book depository because of the assassination and the killing, every car. Yet he is sent to Oak Cliff, which is a mile from Oswald's house. And you, you saw the reenactment there sure. of uh, Oswald's uh, housekeeper seeing the car the police car the dallas police car coming to which is weird well, well, <laughs> really <two>. hey, <laughs> that's on your troll he would they were there to pick him up and give him a ride to disneyland that is that is a, a crazy crazy thing there's not a lot out there um on tippet either well he was in the battle of the ball jerick and as a world war ii veteran um really? and he was award-winning cop uh, as i recall but yeah military guy then he worked at sears roebuck um couple other menial jobs but then he becomes like an award-winning cop you know i mean but it's maybe he was a goody two-shoes i don't know i don't know what the deal is they he was a ladies man he was kind of like an elvis rockabilly guy but he was happy happily married had a couple of kids hmm. and literally the night before took his wife out and you know danced with her to um from what i remember bob wills's hit song faded love wow yeah. yeah somebody he, said he looks like a big dude. He kind of has a football player look about him in a way. Yeah, I don't know what his exact size, but he had a similar size to uh, somebody else that we're going to look at in a little while. But, um, yeah, I mean, he was born in Texas, uh, you know, totally a Texan. Um, but he goes, this is interesting, he's sitting at a gas station, and the call comes out, you know, to go to Oak Cliff, and he's sitting in the car, and part of his job, apparently according to the Warren Commission, was to sit on the other side of the bridge across the Trinity River and mm -hmm. wait in case somebody was escaping. I don't, I don't really know. And he's sitting in this gas station and he speeds off 
uh, for no reason. And he goes to the the uh, um, the record store on Jefferson, goes in there and goes to the phone, the pay phone, makes a call and it rings about seven or eight times. Nobody answers, according to the record store owner who knows him. And um, he speeds out, runs out of the door, jumps in his car and speeds off. And within 10 minutes of him being in that record store, if he indeed was in that record store, the owner never buckled, he was dead. And the timeline that they have to put together, the Warren Commission, is the entire crazy pretzel logic of trying to construct a timeline for Oswald of every waking minute of that day. And when they don't have um, a timeline, um, looks like his widow. Yeah, yeah, I, she lived a long time. The widow made a lot of money. Uh, they didn't have crowdsourcing back then, but everybody in America mailed her money. And there's a little bit of video I was telling Eric this week that there's some video of the Dallas police counting all the money coming in in envelopes in a uh, detective's room at the station house. Uh, she made a lot of money. Uh, the widow, you know, um, and there's a big um, uh, metal sign there on 10th and Patton and Oak Cliff explaining uh, who he was. Um, however, whoever he was may not have been whoever he was. And like uh, everybody else involved. <laughs> yeah. This, this one is baffling. It's absolutely baffling because he, just to get into it briefly, he, is they have to monkey around with the time of death to make it fit into Oswald's timeline because we know that Oswald was back at his rooming house at one o'clock. We know that because the housekeeper was watching CBS News Days of Our Lives that's interrupted by a CBS News bulletin. We know mm -hmm. the time of the bulletin. We know what time Oswald shows up. How he gets there is another mystery because he allegedly takes a bus and then gets into the cab. Uh, when you drill down to the bus driver, nobody can eyewitness him on that bus. It's a crock of shit. When you get into the cab, that cab thing's a crock of shit. And the Warren Commission is trying to get him to the one o'clock um, meeting. Was there something about a wallet you were telling me? Wallet well, that's later. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a second. Okay. But the, the, the situation at that rooming house uh, where Early and Roberts, the housekeeper, sees him, that's kind of like a touchstone. Because that's like she sees him get into his coat. She sees him leave. She sees him go to the bus stop across the street. And it's like 104. So we know what time Oswald gets to the rooming house. We know what time he's across the street. And we know that he's going to get to the Texas theater to see the twin bill with Van Heflin, uh, War is Hell, and, and the uh, B film that's underneath it. Should because, we pull this up and look at this? Yeah, we or, could look at that a little bit now if you want to blow that up a little bit, or I could blow up mine a little bit. How about that? Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, now I'm seeing it. Um, let's see. There is, when you see the Texaco station on the bottom there, Ballow Texaco station, uh, jacket found behind the Texaco station, the... Um, Keep in mind the uh, witnesses up here, up north there. D Domingo Benavides is the closest witness to the shooting. But let's just back up from the shooting for five seconds. And Oswald literally has 10 minutes or eight minutes to go a mile from his house to the, the location of the shooting. Now, the shooting is anywhere from 105... 106. He he put it this way. He's dead at the hospital at 115. He's dead at the hospital. So that whatever happened, he's at the hospital. And they originally wrote 107 on the death certificate and they typed over that 115. So everybody is monkeying around Dallas police, FBI with this timeline, trying to get Oswald from his rooming house to the shooting and then get him to the theater and figure this whole thing out. And no matter how many times they jigger this thing, it doesn't work out. And in here lies an incredible amount of corruption and framing of Oswald. Keep in mind, this is literally 30 minutes after the assassination. The assassination is 1235, right, Eric? At one o'clock, he's in his rooming house. Wow. At 115, Tippett is dead. Think about 
what you just did for the past 45 minutes of your life. Imagine, oh, yeah. sh imagine <laughs> you're shooting the president. You come down six flights of stairs. You, you live about five miles away. Somehow you get home with a multitude of buses and all this traffic with cabs. You also casually bought like a Coke and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. some other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Coke, he drinks it down. He's seen by the motorcycle cop and the manager of the building. He's calm as a cucumber. He, he, he leaves the building and somehow gets home at one o'clock and puts on his coat, may or may not have taken his gun. That's kind of debatable also, and ends up going 30 minutes later. He ends up at the Texas theater. That's what we do know, at, that he does end up there at 1.30. So he leaves at 1 o'clock. If you just take his, his uh, uh, angle on this, he leaves at 1 o'clock, ends up at the movie theater at 1.30 with Butch Burroughs, who's the manager of the movie theater, is selling popcorn and is futzing around. And Oswald doesn't see anybody there and goes in. He's got plenty of money on him. And maybe he's supposed to meet somebody there. Maybe he's just going to see the movie. I don't really know. You know, and he sits in the back, but that's that's his timeline, his personal timeline. What they're trying to do is have him literally walk fast because if he was jogging, so many people would have seen him running through the streets mm. for a mile. That would have been insane. So they walk. Everyone who's tried this cannot do it over the years. Everyone has tried to walk this distance in four minutes, you know, five minutes, six minutes, couldn't pull it off. Well, so, I can tell you, I, I've run. um been a runner and I walk and I can tell you I'm over six feet tall and a fast walker. Right. And a mile, it's, it's a bit of a huff to get, um, you know, get a mile in at 13 minutes or so. Right. And you he's, know, I mean, I he's do not it, running. But it's, yeah, it's tricky. It is tricky, right? Yeah. So, I mean, look, Roger Bannister, a couple of years before had broken the four minute mile. And uh, I think that was 1957 when Bannister breaks the four minute mile running his ass off, right? Nonstop mm -hmm. as fast as he can. But well, you see these people on the bottom here. The, the one that says Warren Reynolds, 500 East Jefferson. Warren Reynolds on the bottom there next to the gas station um, follows him along this, whoever he's following. Uh, follows him along, and when the police um, interview Warren Reynolds, he can't identify Lee Harvey Oswald as the man with the gun after the shooting roaming along East Jefferson Boulevard uh, before he gets into the theater. So Warren Reynolds, uh, two days later, gets shot in the head in his <laughs> car dealership by a rifle. It goes the, the bullet goes through his temple. He miraculously recovers and tells police he can now fully identify Lee Harvey Oswald. He's my favorite <laughs> witness in the entire Kennedy assassination is Warren Reynolds. Uh, he completely got the message, completely turned around. And he said, saw the yes. light. He saw the light. And uh, anyway, so going with these different people, um, Dick Loomis, Jimmy Burr, Frank Wright, Will Smith, Okay, so Ben Benitez gets out of his truck. Now, Ben Benitez, Domingo Benavides, rather, is 15 feet from the murder of Tippett. 15 feet. He's across the street, one car length back in his pickup truck. He ducks down when the shooting starts, and he stays in his car for a number of minutes because he doesn't want to come out. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> right. So they made him change that. These are all changed timelines. He says he stayed in there for a number of minutes out of fear the killer went into his house and was coming, going to come out. And who could blame the guy, right? So he comes out of the car and he go. he's the first guy to find Tippett. Now, he's literally 15 feet from Tippett. He goes over. Tippett is laying face down in a pool of blood. He tries to get on the uh, speaker inside the car but doesn't know how to use it. That's when Bowley comes over, who is the second witness Bowley, uh, another guy who didn't see much but lived across the street, Bowley is able to work the PA thing on the uh, police car uh, mm -hmm. and brings the police to the site. The ambulance shows up even before the police are there and takes the body away. When the police show up, there's no body there. And the police come pretty damn quick. 
you know, and, and the body's already taken away. He's already DOA. They put it at 115 on the on the thing. By the way, his autopsy is missing, and there's a bunch of other problems with the case. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They, they're that quick to pick him up. When yeah. The, when there's this other little incident that happened that yeah, yeah, might yeah. have had all the poli- – that's yeah. a, that's very um yeah they take them away really they're quickly. talented i mean that, that is talented. the one squared away department to be you know right very there talented on. now they, they say that the killer came to the passenger side window which was down and he leaned on the door and when they dusted for prints they found prints of course they didn't match oswald's prints because that would have been too easy they were the, the prints of whoever killed him now if he thought that was oswald as there was this apb out for a, a, just a man you know, it's some vague description. If he thought that was Oswald and it was just him with a mad dog killer of the president, you would think he would be a little bit more attentive than simply talking to the guy through the window. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, because the Warren Commission theory is he was running and he was a mad dog killer. So it doesn't make any sense to tip it would say, hey, how's it going? What are you doing, bro? You know, what are you doing here? And then Tippett gets out of the car, doesn't draw his gun, by the way doesn't take out his gun and then gets blasted by whoever's doing the blasting. So, I mean, that, that dog won't hunt either, Eric. Crazy, crazy. But the point of the matter is we're going to get to this. The, the coup de gras is the guy shoots Tippett three times from across the hood, right? Goes around and puts a bullet in his head, puts a bullet in his head and the bullet goes into the right temple and out the back. Just remember that. It goes mm. into the right temple of Tippett and out the back. And when it goes out the back, that's it. He's gone. He's dead. When they get the, sh- the police show up, one of the policemen who shows up is a guy named Captain Westbrook. Captain Westbrook claims to find a wallet on the ground. And he says to the uh, uh, Bennett, um, who is the FBI agent there, he says to him, um, do you know a guy, <laughs> looking at the wallet, he says, do you know a guy named Lee Harvey Oswald? So Bennett says, no, I never heard of him. He goes, do you know a guy named Alec Heidel? He goes, no, I never heard of him, right? So that's kind of weird. And then, so you got this wallet, right? So when they arrest Oswald a half hour later, lo and behold, he's got his own wallet on him, right? Mm. So now the problem is, that the Dallas news crew filmed what I just said to you. They filmed that footage of of the Captain Westbrook with the wallet in his hand on film for the nightly news saying, I found a guy's wallet named Oswald here at the site of the murder. Now, keep in mind how fast that is, bro. Keep in mind, this is 35 to 45 minutes after the assassination of the president, and they're planting a wallet. That's a fact. They can't get around it, Eric. They can't get around it. Westbrook later goes to Southeast Asia and works for the CIA three years later, by the of way. Of course he does. Right. Leaves the Dallas police force and goes and works in, in Laos um, for the CIA. That's a separate issue. Mm-hmm. Um, he, they then find a jacket underneath a car. I don't know if, if you have a photo of that, but there's a, a, a car lot where this guy was um, uh, chasing him. The guy got shot in the head, Reynolds. Yeah, this is the car lot. This is actually Captain Westbrook Exhibit C. It's found underneath his olds. All of these pieces of evidence have no chain of custody. When the Warren Commission starts asking, which officer gave you this? Who found what? How did they find the shells? They can't remember the name of the cops because they're there to plant evidence. They're not there with a chain of custody. The shell casings of the previous uh, shooting, the the Tippett shooting, are multiple automatic shells. And the the officer who phones it in, Jerry Hill, who's another liar, uh, Sergeant Jerry Hill, he's one of the fixers on the Dallas police force, he phones into headquarters that the killer has a 38 automatic. Now, Oswald had a revolver, so having a 38 automatic is not good. And he knows it's a 38 automatic because he looks at the shell casings and on the bottom of the shell casings that a witness gives him at the site of the Tippett murder, it says 38 auto on the bottom of the shell. So it came from an automatic. Plus, you've got Winchester uh, shell casings and another brand. So you've got a mixed brand of shell casings Mm. at the crime scene itself. 
of the tippet. Now, this is a block away. This is by Jefferson. This is when they they believe or they say they understand Oswald tore off his coat and threw it under the car. Lovely. <laughs> okay. But nobody will admit to finding the jacket. Now, later on, on a windowsill in the lunchroom in the Texas School Book Depository, guess what they find? Oswald's jacket that he went to work with. That's a problem. He has another jacket. This is Wait, the jacket. There's two, there's two wallets, two jackets? Yes, yes. Because when you <laughs> plant evidence, you have to have multiple guns, multiple wallets, multiple everything, Eric. That's what you do. These police forces had, LAPD had the same thing. Uh, you know, when they had um, Hernandez and Pena. These are the fixers. These are the guys whose job it is to fix it. Westbrook was technically... Uh, in the personnel department, Captain Westbrook of Dallas police. These mm -hmm. are guys who plant evidence. These are guys on dirty cases who are the guys who are sent in to fix things up, as we saw with the, the Sirhan case with Pena and Hernandez. They were brought back to the force from where? From the CIA back to LAPD. Where does Westbrook go after this? Goes to the CIA, to Vietnam. This is a revolving door of intelligence personnel going in and out of urban police forces throughout the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, and maybe today for all we know. I don't really know. But the, uh, the reality of it, this case that Westbrook and and Westbrook and, and Hill both say to a officer named Poe, P-O-E, um, <laughs> thanks, Sarge. <laughs> the, they tell Poe to initial the bullet shell casings, the, 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 the hulls, and, and he puts uh, his initials on them. When the bullets, the shell casings get to the Warren Commission, guess what? No initials. And they say to Poe, wow. did you initial them? He says, absolutely. That's what I was told. And of course, Hill and Westbrook in, told him to initial the shell casings like every cop does. You know what I mean? But they kept having to fix them up. You know why? Because the bullets found in Tippett did not match Oswald's gun. Now, isn't that unfortunate? <laughs> isn't that a shithole mess? So you know, they, I, I, it makes yeah. me wonder, though, it's like, it sounds so sloppy. Was this like something went awry and was so last minute that they're just like, go, 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 go. And, you know, like they're just. Well, I mean, think about, so, think about so last minute. I mean, that's an understatement of the year. You're framing a guy in a run and gun situation. The frame is moving in real time. The frame of Oswald, this is 45 minutes after the assassination. You're planting a Oswald's wallet at a crime scene. Of course it's run and gun. Of course it's sloppy. That's the nature of the animal. That's why you need guys like Westbrook and 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 Jerry Hill to do this professionally. That's Was what it because doing. they had to change the parade route at the last minute? I, I'm well, just the saying parade route is, the parade route is a separate issue the day before, by obviously by by Cabell, the mayor of mm -hmm. Dallas, you know, to slow down the car and put it into a triangular uh, uh, hellhole there. But I mean, Cabell's brother is obviously the, the guy who's fired from the CIA by JFK. You know, he was second in command to Alan Dulles. His brother happens to be the mayor of Dallas, which is why they picked Dallas, to be perfectly frank, for the assassination. They tried Chicago a month before. That thing blew up in their face. And they tried Miami in the summer. And that dog didn't hunt either. The Miami thing blew up. Um, but anyway, so the Dallas, the Dallas thing had so many elements attached to it. There's so many people involved in this in this killing, you know, that, that it's, it, it staggers the mind as the years go on when you find out, oh, my God, this guy's involved. How many people are involved in this fucking thing? Because you get to the, the when you finally do get to the autopsy and the fight over the body for the autopsy here in Dallas, how they have to take out machine guns to take that body out of there. They were not doing that to be nice. They had to get that body back to Bethesda Naval Ho Hospital where they can mm -hmm. not do an autopsy, but, you know, as Oliver points out in his new documentary, RFK Revisited, which airs tonight on Showtime, by the way, at 8 o'clock. JFK. It, what, JFK Revisited, I'm sorry. Yeah. The new documentary airs tonight on Showtime. It, it's an amazing piece of work. It's two hours long. There's another two hours, I think, coming next month. Um, but the two hours stands up as an entire documentary by itself. The segment about the autopsy is worth the price of admission on Showtime tonight. I, it's just startling. And this is stuff that Oliver's learned since 1993, uh, since additional files and additional evidence has come out. But getting back to Tippett, the, the Tippett body is taken away so fast 
there is no autopsy on Tippett. Uh, Tippett is, is uh, who knows who's buried in Tippett's grave? We don't even know to this day uh, what's down there in Tippett's grave because, wow. yeah, it's, it's, there's so much about the tip. The reason the Tippett thing is so fascinating is that it happens so quickly. And they're caught so many times in trying to frame Oswald in the span of a couple of hours, just regarding Tippett, just regarding Tippett. You see this frame. Did he know Tippett? What was Tippett doing there? Why did Tippett go to Oak Cliff? Was he there to kill Oswald? Was he there to be a patsy himself? Was he a corrupt cop? You know, I'm going to get to the point right here where on that map, I wanted to show you something which is what I believe happened. And this is my own theory. I don't know if I've ever read this anywhere, but I believe that these two guys who came from this apartment on, on the lower right-hand corner, if you see Jack Ruby apartment, 233 South Ewing, that mm -hmm. is literally an eight-minute walk to the crime scene. And Jack Ruby's whereabouts at that time after he leaves the Dallas Morning News are a mystery. He leaves the Dallas Morning News uh, where he's placing some ads for the Carousel Club that's going to be closed. And he, I presume he goes home and he's working with a guy. He has a henchman, a kid who's a male prostitute, a roustabout um, named Larry Crawford. It was actually Crawford, but he changed it so many times. Just, because... This shows it even better. Oh, you? yeah. This is this is a better one. Great, Eric. Yeah. This is actually Ruby's apartment. A uh, 20 minute walk if you go that way. Um and it's like an eight minute drive, by the way, uh, from the Dallas Morning News to his own apartment, uh, literally in a car. This is on foot. So because um, they said they did get away in a car, the two killers, um, Akilah Clemens, the 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 black woman who was sitting on her porch, described what I believe was Jack Ruby and this guy, Larry Crawford, uh, to a T. It was a stocky guy, short and stocky, two killers. Uh, it would explain the multiple guns. It would explain the multiple ballistics. It would explain uh, a lot of things if it's if it's Jack Ruby and Larry Crawford. Larry Crawford then flees the city. It's apprehended by the FBI a, a day and a half later. And they're saying, why are you fleeing the city? And he says, I didn't want to be linked to the assassination. This, <laughs> Here is, he is. this is the jacket I'm talking about that Larry Crawford I believe, threw underneath the uh, uh, um, car in that lot. That jacket is the jacket they found. That jacket, Larry Crawford came from Hollywood, and I traced that jacket years ago to an exclusive store in Hollywood. And um, he was a male prostitute. Ruby was gay, and Ruby lived with an older gay man named George Senator. But this guy was a, um, a young man that worked around the Carousel Club helped Jack Ruby with his twister device. Jack Ruby was selling a device where you got on it with springs to lose weight and you did like a twist dance. And he was selling it at the state fair and Crawford was working for him at the state fair. Crawford, uh, I think was from Washington state originally came down the coast, stayed sometime in Hollywood in the late, uh, early sixties, late fifties and worked his way down to Jack Ruby, stayed at his apartment also on South Ewing, which is why I'm talking about that apartment. And Crawford lived with him. Uh, I'm presuming there was a sexual relationship between him and Ruby and um, disappeared the next day, but was apprehended. Uh, luckily for us, he then went back when he was released to live in a relative or a sister's cabin in the woods in northern Wisconsin to lay low, where he stayed there for months uh, and didn't come back to Dallas, I don't think ever, but he does testify to the Warren Commission and his testimony is really long because what the Warren Commission does is ask him about every single name in Jack Ruby's phone book. And mostly they're strippers. <laughs> they're mostly strippers. And, and he he has this great uh, exchange with Earl Warren of the Warren Commission. And he says that this particular girl, Jada or one of the strippers, did an exotic dance at the club and Earl Warren senses something of interest to Earl Warren. And he says, what kind of dance? And he says, I, I really can't describe it. It's really dirty. And Earl Warren goes, really? Go on. Tell me about the dirty <laughs> dance. He goes, no, I really can't. And he just goes back and forth. I swear to God in the transcripts, he just says, no, no, tell me how dirty is this dance? Can you describe the dance? And he goes, no, it's so <laughs> dirty. I can't even tell it you. It was a long day. Come on. He needs an outlet. <laughs> God.
<laughs> insane. Um, by the way, for, so everybody knows, I, I will be loading on locals later um, little testimonies um, and interviews that we found. So you can watch them on your own. And, right, right. And check them out, you know, right. witnesses. Right. Well, this episode's about Tippett. So I, I want, because the, the, see, the assassination is too big to take. Yeah, no, Tippett witnesses. These are Tippett Yeah, witnesses. that's what I'm saying. So these yeah. will be Tippett witnesses. When you look at Helen Markham, uh, who is the main witness for the uh, Warren Commission, Markham is batshit crazy. She says that she came out and talked to Tippett for 20 minutes, trying to help him stay alive and just completely nuts. And the Warren Commission has to take her because she's the, the best of the bunch. The rest of them don't identify him in a lineup. And there's all kinds of witnesses who, who you know. Oh, here she is. Yeah, here's Helen Markham. Yeah, she's just kind of fun to watch. I know. I know. Then he got out of the car, slow motion. He calmly crawled out of this car. And uh, he started around to the front of the car. And just as he got even with the front wheel on, that, on the driver's side, this man shot him three times in the wink of your eye. And then he, he turned and he was shooting with this gun and he came back down uh, 10th Street toward me. And he saw me, he stopped. And he looked at me. I looked at him, and he was serious. His <laughs> eyes were big. Of course, mine were, too. And uh, all it was, I put my hands above my face like this, real tight, <laughs> closed my eyes, and I stood there. And then... I all right, you got to the rest okay. of the Well, she, the thing about She Helen, enjoys her moment in the right, limelight. Yeah. <laughs> She's a she reenacts that every decade up until the time she dies in the 80s, the 70s and 80s and 90s. She There's there's footage of her reenacting That's that true. at the Lange age of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's always dependent on the kindness of strangers, Helen. But she, she um, for one point, she has to go to work. And she catches a bus at 102 every day, which is across the street, which is what she's doing out there. And that means that Tippett is literally killed at 103, 104, 102 in that little area. And that's the truth of the killing. He's literally killed like three or four minutes past one o'clock. And, and they just kept moving it forward and forward, trying to get it to 115 or 120 <laughs> so Oswald could get there. But no matter what they did, it wasn't close enough to make Oswald walk there. You know what I mean? And then after Oswald kills him, it still takes Oswald 30 minutes to get to the movie theater. And he's four blocks away from the movie theater. This is four blocks from the Texas theater, by the way, you know, Good Lord. where he goes into the theater and um, uh, the shoe store guy, for some reason, calls the police. The guy next door in the shoe store calls the police, lets him in the back door and says, there he is in the dark, in the dark that that's the guy sitting in the last row and they go to get Oswald. And again, everything we know about this is from the Dallas police telling us the narrative. So don't, you know, be confused by, no, oh, Oswald said this, Oswald said that. We don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. He's, he apparently took out this gun and fired the gun and it didn't uh, fire because the guy put his hand, you know, in the, in the hammer, the revolver, the cop. Well, the FBI said that when they examined the gun, the gun was broken and 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 couldn't fire no matter what happened. So, you know, maybe he had a broken handgun that was three dollars, like the gun that he supposedly had in the in the school book depository that was nineteen dollars. You know, what I mean, wow. these might have been glorified props on his behalf. But, you know, <laughs> we can't get away from that. <laughs> yeah, it might have been a prop gun. Right. It might have been a prop gun. You know, who knows what was in there? But the, the point of the matter is. The FBI could not ma match those bullets, those shells, um, uh, to that gun, and that's a fact. That's a fact. And 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 Dallas police kept trying. They kept sending more bullets. <laughs> they kept and then the bullets were missing for a number of months. And it turns out that the um, the tapes to the radio broadcast to the cars were altered four months after the fact because there was nothing on there telling Tippett to go anywhere. Oh, to do anything. So they brought in some audio forensic experts to listen to the police audio tapes. And mm -hmm. indeed, they laid on new tracks on top of the audio tapes, uh, directing Tippett to go to Oak Cliff. Nobody knows what Tippett was up to before that. You know, he was just roaming around doing something. And look, um, it doesn't end well for Tippett. We know that. But, <laughs> yeah. but maybe, maybe okay for the widow. 
the widow it ended well for the widow um Tippett may or may not have been in the carousel club numerous times he may or may not have been a dirty cop he may or may not have been having an affair uh he may or may not have known oswald i mean there's one version of the story where he goes into that record store top 10 records i think on jefferson and he buys um something i don't know he buys a ticket and then Oswald comes in and buys a ticket to a concert, according to the owner of the record store. He's the mm. owner of the record store. He said Oswald came in that morning and bought a ticket to a Dick Clark American Bandstand presentation that was going to go on in Dallas. I swear, it just, I mean, for somebody to make that up after all this, you know, happened that day or a couple of days later is, I mean, there has to be some veracity to some of these stories. You know what I mean? But the, the answer could be, Eric, that there were numerous Oswald lookalikes floating around Dallas for six months prior to the assassination, making all kinds of demonstrative moves like, you know, Frank Whaley, you know, you see him depicted as an Oswald uh, lookalike in the JFK movie. Um, Woody Harrelson's dad, who obviously could have been a hobo, as we as 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 we now learned and was convicted of uh, being a hitman of a federal judge. So he, he could have been a hobo. But the point of the matter is you got all these Oswald lookalikes running around and something is going on here. They're trying to corner Oswald and he leaves the Texas School Book Depository. Whether he knows he's being cornered or not, he may have sensed it. He may not have sensed it, but he goes to the rooming house, gets his gun, gets a jacket. I mean, what is that police car doing outside the house? If somebody can ever explain that, they claim, and I believe it was Jerry Hill, because Jerry Hill, Sergeant Jerry Hill, said that uh, he checked all the police cars and none of them were missing at, at that time. There were three missing and he had one of them. And <laughs> some, somebody was going to pick up Oswald and finish this off in the middle of the day right then and there. You know what I mean? And I think when Oswald is arrested in a theater, that that precludes them trying to kill him because he keeps yelling i am not resisting arrest i am not resisting Ooh. arrest and I, <laughs> he I, learned I, back then <laughs> right right and he you know later when he gets to the police station he demands representation from the american civil liberties union that somebody should come forward as a lawyer which they refused to give him at that time so he was doing the mcafee I am not Epsteining myself. <laughs> right, right. No, it's in a way. But I mean, keep in mind, there's no Miranda thing going on there. You know, I mean, he's in right. there for 12 hours being interrogated and there's no notes and no tape recordings. I happen to believe there were notes and tape recordings, but they just sat on them. And, you know, they're just not releasing the notes and the and the and the tape recordings. But I mean, somebody must have been taking notes for 12 hours. I mean, it's just ridiculous. How easy is that to do? You know, and then you just don't release them. I mean, you know. Whatever he said, he, he apparently for 12 hours stuck to his story, you know, that I worked in the school book depository and, and you know, went to work with Wesley Buell Frazier, who gave me a ride at my house uh, from, you know, staying with Ruth Hill, uh, Ruth Payne, rather. The, the real interesting thing is, is uh, the deputy sheriff, Roger Craig, who claims that he sees Oswald when he leaves the building get into a white or gray Rambler station wagon with a roof rack driven by a swarthy man. And he sticks mm. to this story. And it turns out that that car is matched as being the car that Ruth Payne owns. And Captain Fritz says to him, that's Ruth Payne's car. Don't drag her into this mess. Now, that's something for the chief of police to say to a deputy uh, sheriff. Mm -hmm. the day of the assassination and he never buckles roger craig he never buckles they try to kill him like 10 times he's finally fired he was police officer of the year the year before and the guy's a straight mm -hmm. shooter um and claims that he saw oswald getting into that rambler uh, station wagon which explains how he got home is what i'm saying it explains how he got from point a to point b what the warren commission did was put him on a bus Put him in a cab, get him to his house, and then so he went to... from a bus to a cab. Yeah, because the bus got stuck in traffic, <laughs> right? And there's nobody on the bus who will oh identify my God. him. This yeah. sounds like a ten year old kid. Yeah, that you keep going back to, and you're saying, "Well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense." Oh, oh no, but it was traffic. 
And so then right. he got into a cab. He gets out of the bus. Now, 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 dig, dig. Who's the who's the main witness of him on the bus? Some woman. This is this is true. His ex landlady, who hated his guts, happened to get on that bus and saw him and identified him to the Warren Commission as getting on that bus. But the whole thing fell apart because no, nobody on the bus saw this guy, and and the, even the bus driver um, said he was a black kid who was a teenager. The next day, the whole the whole thing falls apart. The whole thing with the with with the uh, the taxi cab driver falls apart too. And you could see how desperate they are to construct this, you know, five mile trip to Oak Cliff to his rooming house on Beckley. And and it's still they can't do it. Still, it falls apart. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because none of the, they can't connect all the dots. But I mean, it's kind of amazing how desperate they are to get him to tip it because the tip it killing, as the Warren Commission said, is the Rosetta Stone of the assassination. If he killed Tippett, he killed the president, which is insane. But that was their claim at the time. The desperate man, he was an angry young guy, a mad dog killer fleeing, you know, to get away. And he killed Tippett just like he killed the president. Now, some of us think that Tippett might have been used for another purpose. Yeah. Didn't you say he had a nickname? He had a nickname and his nickname was Jack. And the reason his nickname was Jack was because everybody on the Dallas police force teased him that he looked like a guy named JFK. And there it is, my friend. Take a look at that at home in your studio apartments, wherever you live, because that, my friend, is Tippett on the right and the president of the United States, JFK, on the left. And the Dallas the police, lips lining up. Here. everything lines up. And the reason it's important is a number of, number of reasons. The coup de grace shot to Tippett is the exact same shot that JFK had in the right temple from the grassy knoll blowing out the back of his head. And when I read that a number of years ago, the guy literally goes over and shoots him in the right temple, and which has an entrance wound on his right temple and blows out the back of his skull. The ambulance shows up, picks up the body. He's already dead. They take him to the hospital and they pronounce him dead at 115. Originally 109, they type over it at 107. You can't really tell. But the reality of it is, if you read Mark, uh, David Lifton's book, Best Evidence, he talks about having two bodies, one on Air Force One, one on Air Force Two. And they're both flown out of Dallas in different caskets. There's numerous people in the documentary Best Evidence and in the book who are involved in body bags and the transfer of these two bodies as two ambulances at Bethesda. And he doesn't mention Tippett. There's nothing in the book about Tippett. He just mentions a second body being driven in a second ambulance in a separate body bag that's brought into the uh, um, uh, autopsy room in Bethesda. And this is my theory. This has nothing to do with, with best evidence, although obviously in Beth, this is the overhead shot of the tracheotomy on top of the entrance wound. Now this wound is the, keep in mind, this is the first shot that Kennedy, when he lunges over in the car, this shot in the throat comes straight from the grassy knoll. And we know that because the bullet goes through the windshield and the windshield hole is seen by numerous spectators at Parkland. And the windshield has a bullet hole right where it lines up with his neck. And we also know that the uh, car was flown to um, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and put into a uh, into the uh, GM factory where the glass was changed, and the glass was removed because we have numerous statements by the people who worked in that factory that they switched out the glass on the limo, and it had a bullet hole in it from the outside of the inside, and that shows, despite the hole being made into a tracheotomy, that there was gunfire from the front of that uh, uh, front of the car. There's an uncanny resemblance, especially with this picture and the other. Yeah, yeah, like absolutely. A, a little bit more of an Adam's apple. Yes, yes. A little less Adam's apple here, a little more Adam's apple here. Yes, but the, the... I think what they want is the brain and the skull. And mm -hmm. I think what they wanted was the body. The, the body's fine, but they don't really care that much about the body. What they want is the bullet holes in the back, and they want the brain. The brain comes out and is weighed. And it's perfectly higher than the average weight of a brain. 
And that's one of the staggering things about the autopsy, the brain weight. And so much brain matter was lost uh, in the course of the, the limo, in the course of Jackie, in the course of Parkland. That, uh, by a, the conservative estimate, a third of the brain was gone, you know, maybe a half. And yet, in the official autopsy, where Commander Humes decides to burn his notes, you know, after the autopsy, the weight well, of that's the- normal. <laughs> he, he said it had blood stains on it. There's no reason to save it. Oh, it's the, dirty, yeah. Th 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 there's no reason to save the autopsy of the president. I mean, why would anybody do that? So he burns his autopsy notes. And both these guys are under immense pressure. I don't even fault these two guys, Boswell and Humes. In fact, Berkeley- who Admiral Berkeley, who is the personal physician of JFK on numerous occasions late in his life, um, makes attempts to contact JFK researchers to talk to them. And then each time mm. he bails out the next day saying, don't ever contact me again. And a number of months go by and it's Berkeley and they go, holy shit, he's ready to talk. And then he bails again. Berkeley. And they keep hearing clicks in the line whenever they talk to him. Yeah. Know, well, it's, it's a strange thing. Yeah. You and Oliver both know about phone clicks. A lot of <laughs> A lot of people listening. And now we're just going on YouTube, so we make it easy for them. Oh, hey, why not? But, I mean, the, the, the fact that Tippett may have been taken from that crime scene, he may have been killed for two purposes. One, to have a body for the autopsy, and two, to frame Oswald into the killing of a police officer, you know, and have a double double homicide. And mm -hmm. I think it may, that's, I kind of believe happened here. You know, and I, and I think that the guy who killed him who will now kill again on Sunday, this is Friday, is Jack Ruby. And I think that Ruby and, and Crawford killed uh, Tippett. I think they knew Tippett. I think they were assigned to kill Tippett. I think they did the killing just like he did on Sunday night, you know, Sunday when he kills Oswald. Uh, I think he had a job to do, and I think Ruby did it. And I think he went back to his apartment, which was literally, you know, a, 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 a few feet away. Amazing. Yeah, I think amazing. it's an amazing story, and I think... There's more to it than meets the eye in terms of just looking at this little piece of the assassination. You know, in, in future episodes, what I'd like to do is just look at one part at a time, like just do an episode on Jack Ruby. You know what I mean? Because yeah. a lot of these things are too big to handle. We could do, you know, an episode on Wesley Buell Frazier. Wesley Buell Frazier is, is the kid who drives Oswald to uh, to work that morning. Everybody and comment below if you want this. If you and, do want this, suggest. yeah, let us know because Wesley Buell Frazier is the only other person charged with the murder of the president of the United States. And they told him he was going to go to the electric chair in Texas unless he cooperated. And he all of a sudden started talking about Oswald taking curtain rods into the car that he drove to the Texas School Book Depository that morning. Wesley Buell Frazier flips that he's brought back twice, given a lie detector test and threatened with the electric chair. And he's actually charged with the murder of the president. They find a British Enfield rifle in his, in his house and tons of ammunition. They seize that, the Dallas police, and they threaten him uh, that if he doesn't cooperate, he's going to go to the electric chair for the murder of the president because they do find a British Enfield rifle on the roof of the Texas School Book Depository. There is footage that I've seen, newsreel footage of them climbing down from the roof with that British Enfield and a bunch of cops examining that British Enfield rifle on the ground. And that rifle, I believe, was Wesley Buell Frazier's. And they were trying to have a backup guy they could frame or flip or, you know, something of that nature to uh, to either frame him or Oswald or whoever they want to frame at that point. But, I, I, you know, I don't think it was necessarily Oswald. It could have been Frazier for all they, all they cared. But the, the amazing ability to run and gun with this frame, you know, and, and, and like you said, I mean, this is all in real time, Eric. This is, I mean, this is the skill of the Dallas Police Department, not solving mm -hmm. crimes, but framing people. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, so, some could say the uh, FBI manages to find a lot of plots. Right. But keep in mind, I'll tell you something interesting about the FBI. The average guy on the ground, and there were tons of FBI agents on the ground, the average guy was honest and did his job. When they mm. take these initial uh, um, filings by witnesses, they're literally just taking what the people are saying. Those are really straight on documents. In other words, they go into Wesley Buell Frazier's mother. And, they, and I've read this uh, uh, statement from her to the FBI, and she said Oswald had nothing in his hands other than a small sandwich bag that he put into his coat pocket when my son took him to work that morning, because she lived there too, the mother. There was mm. no rifle. There was no curtain rods. It's only uh, Lenny May Randall, his sister, and him 
that say that he had curtain rods that were probably the rifle. And when he gets to the when he gets to the Texas School Book Depository, there's a man standing on the loading dock. And that man is the manager of the Texas School Book Depository, he opens up the building for the workers in the morning. And he told the FBI that Oswald had nothing in his hands when he went to work. So now you've got two FBI statements from two people saw him in point A, point B, picked up, taken to work with no rifle in his hand, no curtain rods, no nothing. And what they did was the Warren Commission and the Dallas police and FBI also was just weed out all these extraneous different, you know, uh, statements mm -hmm. until they got the statements that they want. And like, you know, the woman who saw the uh, two killers of Tippett, uh, um, Clemens, Mrs. Clemens, she said nobody talked to her initially. And then when 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 they did show up, they threatened to kill her. Dallas police and the FBI, they said, you're going to, something's going to happen to you if you talk to anybody. And she says that to Mark Lane on film, you know, and then she does disappear a little bit later on. There she is. This is Akilah Clemens, who was across the street and saw the whole shooting. Mrs. Clemens, where were you on November 22nd, 1963? I was working for Miss Motherman, uh, 327 East 10, just where? down the block from where two people were killed. Did you know Officer Tippett? Yes, I saw him met pretty many times. And did you hear the shots? Yes, I heard the shots. And what did you do? I ran out into the street and looked down the street, and I ran back down the street where he was lying, and I looked at him. Now, when you heard the shots and you went out of the house, did you see a man with a gun? Yes, I did. What was he doing? Oh, he was reloading it. When I said he was reloading his gun. And oh, that's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, pausing right. to reload the gun. I'll have that uploaded to local. Okay, yeah, because she talks about that it's two men, and she describes what I think is Jack Ruby physically in that in that uh, uh, Mark Lane interview. And she's doing this. She's, this is this is a courageous woman. I mean, they told her that that you know not to talk to anyone, or she's going to get hurt. And and this is Dallas police that came in uniform to her house. You know, the, a few days later, and they you know like in the Sirhan case, they intimidated witnesses. You know, because they wanted the narrative that they had. Now, maybe these cops weren't even in on it, you know, but they were told that this is the narrative and we don't want this woman blabbing to the press, you sure. know. But I think there's something more nefarious to it than just that. I, I, I think that she uh, saw what she saw and seeing two men who are not Oswald killing Tippett. And she knew Tippett. Tippett was the neighborhood cop. Tippett was the guy that patrolled that area of Oak Cliff and uh, 10th and Patton. So she knew who Tippett was, you know, as did everyone in that area. Yeah, she said that early on. You know, yeah, 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 I know. There's a little tone in there, though, that like, well, not necessarily a big fan of him. Yeah, they the, the later on, I think the Warren Commission, of course, didn't call her as a witness. They don't call anybody who's got anything odd to say. They said, you know, she obviously had diabetes and couldn't see, you know, but she saw it perfectly well what they look like and the description mm -hmm. of them, you know. But uh, and later told Mark Lane that that description right there. All right. Well. This has been an amazing story. So what do we have coming next? Um, what do we have next? We wanted to do the Thanksgiving special, Eric. Yep. We're going to do a little surprise on Thanksgiving. We're not going to tell anybody what it is, but right. um, I'm not going to be releasing on my channel because obviously I'm not going to put somebody through a live stream on Thanksgiving. So we're going to try to record something and then release it on Thanksgiving as a treat for everybody. Oh, Dealing my. with... Uh, the, the pilgrims. pilgrims, the pilgrims. Yeah. Oh, right. So. There's a pilgrim special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mayflower, the it's Mayflower special. Yeah, if you want to read about it, you can buy my book uh, Rehab Nation. It's in there. You want to follow me at Lord Buckley uh, on Twitter. I'm I'm there. But yeah, we're gonna get into uh, some Thanksgiving history, untold story. This is maybe you know what, Eric. This might be other than Jamestown. This might be the original untold American story. Mm, could be, could other, be. Other than Jamestown, you know. So, well, not uh, only uh, Jamestown, but don't forget Roanoke. That's the ultimate I untold story Roanoke. because they just got removed. <laughs> yeah, what happened to Roanoke? They were just eaten oh, they, by... yeah, they 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 went native. I, I they think they pretty right. much proven that you know coincidentally DNA tracks from Native American tribes seem to line up oddly well with the um, older English. Families. Oh, I see. I so they you. think that you know, especially it was there were some really bad um, 
droughts and things at the time. And, and you know, if you're way the hell away, it's like, hey, how, we're starving. How long here. was Roanoke inland? I thought it was on the water. Was it inland or um it was it was it was much closer to the water. Uh, Jamestown's actually further inland, but oh, remember, Jamestown. okay, I know one of well, them. Spain, um, remember Spain had the stronghold here, so they right. hid. So they right. went inland more because they did not want to be right along the coast, you know, with fires at night and attract the Spanish. You're kind of, you know, sneaking in the um, okay. country. I just want to give a shout out to tonight is the premiere yes, I'm gonna be show time. Playing. I'm going to show the trailer. Afterwards. Yes, uh, okay. we're closing out with a trailer to uh, for everybody to check that out. JFK it's Revisited. Yes, which is on tonight at eight o'clock on Showtime. Look, you could sign up for yeah. Showtime for free for thirty days, like I did, just to watch the the documentary. You don't there have you to give Showtime your money, but it is a startling, startling documentary that I really urge everyone to take a look at and and um, study carefully. There's a lot of information. You may have to watch it a couple of times um, if you think I'm giving you too much information. Oliver just packs it in there and. You know, it just doesn't let you go from the second this movie starts till the end. So maybe we can discuss that and just that documentary at some point. You know, Eric, maybe oh, we for can, sure. we yeah, just yeah. do a show about that. Yeah, who knows? So maybe somebody could reach out to a friend. No. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> There's people all over this town doing crazy shit. You know, yeah. You never know. You never, you never know. know who's in town, you know. But uh, yeah, if you want to PayPal us, Eric and I are available to take your money for the book fund. Locals. And locals. Unstructured.locals.com. Right, I'm gonna upload stuff there. We I'm already put some to, stuff up, didn't we, Eric? Yeah, we got stuff there. We're gonna put the um, the interviews, you know, from different people. I've tried to upscale them as best I can because the video is really old right. and really hard to deal with. But it'll be there, so people can check that out. Oh, as that's well. exciting! I want to check it out so, myself. This sounds until like next fun. time. Okay, folks, stick around, watch the preview. Because oh yeah, watch this. It this looks is great. awesome. It's, and, it's only two minutes long, but you got to check this out. This is brilliant. What kind of a peace do we seek? Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died some 38 minutes ago. Here is a suspect, 24-year-old Lee H. Oswald. I'm just a patsy. President. Who actually fired the shots that killed Kennedy? Was there a conspiracy? In the years since the Warren Report, there is now so much more that we know. Conspiracy theories are now conspiracy facts. The Warren Commission successfully deceived the public. Alan Dulles' appointment to the Warren Commission is one of the great frauds of American history. Documents are withheld by the FBI, the CIA. Intelligence agencies did all the wrong things if they were looking for conspiracy. We will go back and piece together new facts and evidence that shed more light on what really happened here that day. Commission believes that the same bullet that hit Kennedy hit Carly. Well, I don't believe it. It is indeed a magic bullet. Oswald was a figure of interest for four years before the assassination. They were reading his mother's mail. His first year in office, Kennedy made many enemies. He vows he's going to shatter the CIA into a thousand pieces. Have you ever committed any act of violence? He was intimately involved in the cover-up. Once you kill a president on the streets of American City, that sends a signal. The rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man are threatened. If America really wants a democratic society, and we should get to the bottom of this traumatic crime that continues to reverberate throughout American history. This nation will not be fully free until all its citizens are free.